Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Vixen Sphinx mount, sold from about the year 2000 to around the year 2015 or so. So Vixen mounts are no stranger to our hobby. In the 1990s, those were the mounts that we were all using. Polaris, Super Polaris, Great Polaris. I invested heavily in that Polaris series of mounts in the 1990s, but around the year 2000, consumer taste began to change. Everybody wanted a go-to mount. And this was Vixen's solution, sort of this space agey looking piece of equipment. And keep in mind in the year 2000, it was the Wild West out there. Nobody really knew what standard was going to take over, and so people decided to just experiment to see what they could find. And this is what Vixen did. This was the Star Book. It's a display with a 320 by 240 resolution, very high resolution for the time, and a database of several thousand objects. So I'm going to put this thing through its paces and let's see if it still holds up today. So just so you know, when I do these reviews, typically I'll film them in the order in which you see the segments. In other words, the introduction I film first, the conclusion is last, and so forth. And the idea behind that is that we find out together how the product performs. So again, I haven't seen this yet. It's still just got this in here, but I'm going to make a prediction because it's a Vixen product, it's going to be quirky. Okay, so we're here with the Sphinx mount, and I have to say mechanically, this thing is very strong. I don't know if this is coming across on video, but this thing is made of solid metal. There's no plastic here. It is very cleanly made, no external cables except for this RS-232 style cable going to the Starbook and the power cable going down to a battery that's sitting on the floor. So again, mechanically, there's really not much to say here. The right ascension axis is here. A couple of minor quirks here. This lock, there's an identical looking lever on the other side. That's the lever that sets your altitude. And they look the same, and I mix them up a couple of times. A little bit of minor thing there. And the other thing is there's a locking lever here, but on the declination, it's this weird double-sided clamp. Uh, again, nothing really serious, but that's just a little bit uh, oddity that I noticed there. And also, astute telescope observers may notice the size of the counterweight here is a lot smaller than you might expect for a mount of this size. And that's because below the right ascension housing here, a lot of the electronics, including apparently the motors, are housed down here and act as its own counterweight, partial counterweight at least. Nice thinking. So overall, mechanically, this thing is really solid. In fact, this may be the tightest, most solid fielding mid-size mount that I've ever seen in this class. But as it is, your overall impression of this mount is going to depend not on the mechanical assembly, but on what you think of this, the Starbook. Okay, the Starbook. Well, let's just say, you know, I think I have played with almost every one of the major operating systems, at least the ones that you can do in English. And I think the product is well named Sphinx because I couldn't figure it out. I had to consult this, the manual. I had to have this walk me through the process. Um, you know, in principle, it's not any different than most other go-to mounts. You pick some known objects in the sky, tell the telescope where it is, you keep doing it, the accuracy improves, and then it builds a model of the sky. You can go wherever you want. How it goes about it is a little bit different, however. So first of all, the display. Again, as I said before, 320 by 240, back in the day, probably looked really good and high resolution. It pales compared to even the worst smartphone that you can find today. And in fact, looking at a star, I was like, am I on the star? Am I not on the star? I could really use a few more pixels here to see if I'm actually on the object itself. So it is looking quite dated that way. So when you start this off, it tells you to point the telescope due west. So we're going to go ahead and pretend to do that here. Let's pretend that's due west. A little bit unusual there, but not too bad. And then it asks you before you start that you're not going to be pointing it at the sun. So here's the thing that I found confusing. It goes into two modes. There is a scope mode. And in scope mode, you can move the telescope using the keypad. And in chart mode, it's just a chart. You can move around without having to move the scope at all. So you know the computer wants you to know which mode you're in because in chart mode, the screen goes blue, and in scope mode, the screen goes red. The problem is 
the toggle switch to go between the two is right next to this four position switch that moves the scope and in the dark you're not always looking in the right place. I always found myself in one mode when I thought I was in the other and wind up doing something that I actually didn't want to do. So by the way on this keypad here you'll notice there are two sets of four keys and I'm, I can't help but think that maybe this thing was influenced by video game controllers. You'll also notice there is no keypad so typing in an NGC or an IC number involves a lot of cursor hunting and pecking. Could have wished for a numeric keypad there. So I've randomly picked a star here. It says Denim, but I've done a fake in line indoors here. We're going to say go to, and you'll see something that bothered me quite a bit here. It's slow. I have all the settings on high here and it just, I just kept wishing this thing would go faster. Yeah, I know we're all indoors and we're comfortable like this and this may not seem that bad, but when you're outdoors in the dark and it's cold out, you're, I just found myself wishing this thing would go faster. Okay, so you may have heard the beep there. That means it thinks it's on the target. Keep in mind the first target on any go-to system is always going to be off a little bit. So you've got to go in and zoom in and then use the keypad to move the scope exactly to the object itself. So here we come to what is probably my biggest mechanical complaint here, the enormous amount of hysteresis in the mount. In other words, when you stop pressing the button, the mount continues to move for as long as another three to four seconds. By that point, the object has drifted out of where you want it to be. Then you wind up hitting the opposite button to make it go back. And then it's always, you know, it doesn't stop there and you wind up chasing your tail. There is an anti-backlash compensation feature in the menu. There are numbers you put in. There are no units attached to those numbers. I tried several different kinds of numbers and combinations of numbers. It didn't seem to help. So after you do this, you can continue to add alignment points, and as you do so, the accuracy gets better. This mount will take up to 20 alignment points. That's pretty impressive. I found I didn't have to go anywhere near that. By the time I got to four or five objects, it was fine. I had no problems with pointing accuracy. In fact, this thing I thought was above average. So I'm looking in the back of the Starbook, and there's a port there that says Auto Guider. Hmm. That's interesting, an auto guider port on a mount that's this early. Let's try taking some astro photos with it. So I hooked up my auto guider to it, used PHD2 software, had it do an auto alignment, and mount failed to calibrate. Auto guider did not appear to work. And I'm thinking, okay, well, it's just old. The auto guider port just is dead somehow. Well, that actually wasn't the case. Remember how I told you before that Vixen was quirky? Well, it turns out the auto guider port does work but you would have to contact them and pay them a fee and they would give you a key code that you would put into the controller just for the privilege of using the auto guider. I don't know what they were thinking. You've already paid a lot of money for the mount. They're asking for more money just to use the auto guider port. So this particular Starbook had version 1.0 on the firmware. It had never been updated. So it fell to me to update the firmware. So what you need on this is one of these. It's a crossover LAN cable. An auto guider cable isn't good enough. A straight through cable isn't good enough. It has to be a crossover LAN cable. And the Vixen website was hard to navigate. I had to go to a Cloudy Nights thread to find the exact link to download the firmware updater. Thank you, Cloudy Nights. I'll put that link in the description below so you don't have to go hunt for that the way that I did. But it'll work on Windows 10. And I don't know about you, whenever I do something like this, I get the cold sweats that I'm somehow going to brick the device. But I hooked it up, I followed the directions, and the firmware got updated to v2.7, which I believe is the last version they came out with sometime around 2015. So with the auto guider port enabled, I went back, tried to take some astro photos, and it seems fine. So here are some astro photos that I took here. And I wasn't trying to get great images here. I'm mainly trying to see the accuracy of the port. And I think it's quite good. It's just as good as just about any other mount that I've ever seen. One complaint that some people have about this mount is that this mount tracks not only in right ascension, it also tracks in declination to try to compensate for errors in your polar alignment. Some people are saying this may have been a case of Vixen outsmarting themselves and the declination tracking tends to screw things up. So I went and looked at some of the subframes that I've taken here. Some of these are as long as two minutes. 
I didn't see anything at least in mind, but just keep in mind that some people have complained that it's an issue with their mount. So one additional thing I noticed here when playing with this is that the Starbook knows 22,000 or so objects. That sounds like a lot, but 17,000 of those are stars. And in fact, when you go to the NGC IC list, it only knows something like 4,980 objects. Again, that sounds like a lot, but when you compare it to the total amount of NGC and IC objects, it's actually not a lot. And some of the omissions were odd. For example, at least on this firmware version that I updated to 2.7, it did not know IC 434, that's the Horsehead Nebula, nor is the Horsehead Nebula listed under named objects. A little bit strange. It also didn't know IC 443, that's the Jellyfish Nebula nearby, nor did it know IC 405 or IC 410 in Auriga. These are all commonly imaged objects in the winter sky. I don't know who's making these decisions. So overall, my complaints about the mount involve the hysteresis, the backlash in the mount, which may be able to be corrected, the overall slowness, which drove me crazy, the lack of resolution on the screen, which can't really be faulted for the error that it's in, and I wished for more objects in the database. Otherwise, if you can live with that, perfectly fine mount. So there you have it, a look at the Vixen Sphinx mount. You know, most people in the hobby have at least heard of this product, but you don't see very many of them out there. For whatever reason, the operating system and the product line never really caught on. They do have a new version out that has a updated Starbook called the Starbook 10. I haven't seen that version yet, I hope to someday. But in the end, you know the price may have done this thing in. Almost $2,700 towards the end of its production run during a time when people like Mead, Celestron, Orion, Skywatcher, Ioptron, and others were offering similar amounts with arguably identical, if not even better performance, at less than half the price. So the acid test, would I spend today my own money on one of these if it were to come up for sale? I don't know, that's a tough sell. I am very impressed with the mechanical construction. I don't think I've ever seen a more solidly built mount in this class but the software, I think, is really starting to let me down. I used this thing exclusively for almost a month when I had it. I wanted to see what it was like to use just this product and nothing else. And I have to admit, towards the end of that month, I was starting to look longingly over at my CG5, my AVX, and my CGE. I think if one of these were to come up at a very attractive price, I might consider picking one of these up. And even then, it would mainly be a backup. But as always, the choice is yours. I hope this has given you some information to decide if this mount is right for you should one pop up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.